Hi. Um, I have a couple questions for Marissa. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on sur surveillance and <coughs> reality TV um, and how it has, how, what are your thoughts on the effects of, a, of that as uh, a participant and the effects on participants as well as uh, people as viewers um, and sort of how to navigate this sort of third foyer that's present. Can you say more about what you're thinking about the third voyeur? Well, it's like it's different from surveillance systems that were sort of integrated into as citizens. Um, it's like a form of entertainment, but it's also a form of sort of like self-reflection in a way. Yeah. Uh, reality TV, like specifically. Mm -hmm. um, I am really interested in reality TV. Actually, um, after I audition for American Idol, I made a video that was a fictional reenactment of my audition, um, cutting together footage from the show and um, recordings of me pretending to audition um, in a studio environment. And um, I was even just interested in um, the different genre conventions of reality TV. So, I mean, literally very formally. So, for instance, um, television is known for having approximately twice the number of cuts as film and reality TV is known for having double the number of cuts of other TV. Um, so that was something that I integrated into my piece. Um, I'm also very interested in surveillance um, as an issue. I've taught classes on surveillance um, and surveillance or um, it's a term that some people use to refer to kind of counter surveilling or surveilling from below. Um, but I think that, you know, I find myself being interested in this kind of par what I see as a paradox between um, people not wanting to be seen and wanting to be seen. Um, and I think that it, certainly within our culture, um, and as was reflected kind of in my high school poetry, you know, there's this idea of like, I want to be heard, I want to be seen. And that phrase being seen itself um, is kind of the phrase that refers to being validated or recognized or acknowledged in some way that we all kind of seem to need. But at the same time, we don't want to be, you know, spied on. Um, so that is a, a thing that I think is very interesting in this cultural moment of Instagram and social media and things like that. But sorry, I'm probably talking too long now. Um, and I have another question about blogs um, and sort of where do you think the form of the blog lives today? Is, is it still relevant as a format of writing? Um, has it failed in any ways? Has it succeeded? And sort of what are the differences between writers who, um, or sort of what are your hopes and expectations of writers who have kind of had that format available to them um, generationally and how that's different from previous writers who've had sort of personal diaries and that being published? Sort of like there's an intrinsic relationship to that style of writing that's like immediately public. Um, and how, like, your thoughts on how that kind of changes how you write and how you think people write? Oh, good questions. Um, I actually did a net art piece um, with a collaborator that was commissioned by the Whitney um, called Abe and Mo Sing the Blogs. And we actually made a blog, this was in 2006, we made a blog that kind of reblogged some of our favorite posts from bizarre blogs. Like one was called I Hate Horses, and it was just a super, super long post just saying over and over, I fucking hate horses. <laughs> um, and then we sang them, and we called the blog a mixtape, and each post was considered a track, and we were thinking about the genre conventions of blogs and the idea that blogs at the time were starting to be referred to as the voice of the people in the same way that other forms of journalism or citizen journalism used to be. I think now, um, arguably, it, the novelty is sort of gone and we may often look at things that are we may not even realize are blogs and some of it is about a, a technological structure like having being serial or 
having a, an RSS feed or a permalink that's separate from the main page. But I think that it's become such a dominant um, form for publishing that, and certainly we've seen a lot of paper-based publications die um, or, and or kind of migrate to blogs, um, that now I don't even know that there's necessarily such a distinction anymore between blogs and other things. I'll just say one last thing. Um, I was thinking um, as you were presenting that I had this conversation with a friend recently who pointed out to me that once upon a time typing was a really common profession and people would take classes to do it and they would refer to themselves as typists um, and there were some people who could type and some people who couldn't type or couldn't type very well and now we're just kind of all typists right like we're always typing and we kind of don't necessarily distinguish anymore between the activity of typing and the activity of writing or communicating or whatever and I think that that's kind of true for maybe a, a lot of us in terms of the way that writing um, infiltrates our larger practices. Can you guys hear me? Um, could I, I want to build on that for a second because I think it's interesting because while we are typing a lot and it feels like writing, uh, there is also, I think, a lot of, set, I say this in triangulation at one point, that we, it seems like we're moving more towards an oral a sort of society that's like an oral culture rather than a written culture. And I find it really interesting that we're having panels like this where we're really interested in writing because it feels like somehow the act of writing has like been co-opted by the act of speaking, which is really the act of typing. So there's like this kind of, this kind of like interesting circular moment right now where we're not sure what we mean by those different, act, those different verbs. Um, and yeah, I don't know what that means, but it's just an observation. I, th I think, uh, work? Oh, I think it's on. Um, it makes me think of the quip, I think it was about when Kerouac wrote On the Road, I forget who criticized it, but that's not writing, it's typewriting. Um, <laughs> but then also, uh, just a personal footnote, when I, when I got out of art school, um, I didn't have any skills, like I thought, oh, if I have an MFA, I'll be okay, <laughs> which eventually I, I was, but um, I needed some money to tie me over. Uh, so I worked as a, as a temp uh, with the new skill of word processing. And um, it was a time when word processing machines were these big standalone things. And the one I used was a Bidec, which looked like a Star Trek <laughs> kind of thing, like a desk that surrounded you. And um, on early jobs, I would go into, say, a law firm, and they'd say, our word processing technician has arrived. And, <laughs> and nobody really knew where to situate the skill. Um, and, uh, you know, and then as personal computers came on the market, it became a universal skill, but um, it was monetizable at one point. Hi, um, I have a question for Mr. Miller. Hi, over oh, here. Hi. Um, you mentioned your work with uh, personal ads that yes. you had made, and I, I recently read your essay about that work, and you, you talk about Veblen's uh, definition of aesthetics as that which exceeds pure function. Yes. And I was wondering if you think about that definition in terms of your own writing on art or on your own writing at all. You seem to be very interested in sort of the aesthetics of certain types of writing. And I wonder if you sort of think about that when you're writing about art generally. It's funny, I never thought of it that way, but I can, I can see where you're going that if the, um, and, and it's funny, even in texts that aren't supposed to be aesthetic, I, I try to craft them so that they have an aesthetic uh, quality. Um, and it's funny, um, I, I thought of something like in the early part of Rob's uh, readings where um, there's a kind of, I often think of writing in opposition to like the discourse that's made evident in panels where um, Writing can be this kind of private experience where you can control everything. And for me, it's like, it's kind of like uh, 
the opportunity to come up with a line or an answer that I'd be too slow to get in real life, but since I have like all the time in the world to write, I can like construct it. But then that also becomes like the fantasy element of writing. And that, um, so what I strive for is a kind of economical and simple style that's also aesthetically pleasing. And, and that can help convince your readers to agree with you. I mean, there's like a kind of vested interest in that. Um, but also, um, for me, it's very much bound to the pleasure of writing. So it's, there's like a, on the one hand, you're often making an argument, but there's like this fantasy sidebar because there's no other voices intervening um, and contradicting uh, what you have to say. Uh, so, how to take all that back to Veblen and, and, and the idea of excess. Um, who do I always oppose Veblen to in my mind? I'm blanking out. But, um, but Veblen was basically puritanical and um, I think there was a truth to his kind of puritanical criticism of excess. Uh, and I suppose the exact opposite, maybe this is what I counterpose, is um, uh, the Frankfurt School critique of instrumentalization. That would be like the other side of the coin. You know, so for Veblen, uh, anything that wasn't strictly functional uh, was invidious. That's the term he liked to use. That would show. Um, that someone has the capacity to waste that another person doesn't. So the person who has that, that aesthetic capacity to waste um, uh, lays claim to a kind of a superior uh, position in the social and cultural hierarchy. Um, the Frankfurt School treats that entirely differently that, you know, say Adorno maybe paradigmatically, um, looks for non-instrumentalization, that something that can't be integrated into a capitalist system is valuable because it um, stands outside the system. Um, where writing falls in all of that, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I, maybe because I tend to think of writing um, as less having to do with like a kind of sumptuous display uh, but I think you're nonetheless on to something because they, to get the aesthetic effect, it requires extra effort. And, and it is a kind of luxury. Um, so it's a question of how to evaluate it. So that's a very non-definitive answer. And, and maybe I'm just like repeating the terms of your question. No, no, that's you. great. Thanks. It was a pretty open-ended <laughs> um, question. But, um, but yeah, I think it's a good point. I mean, to, to come at it maybe another way and maybe to tie it to the question about blogging, I think, you know, we, I feel like when a lot of, when a lot of like long form writing, which was not thought of then, it was just simply thought of as writing, <laughs> but uh, when a lot of that type of writing was produced, I think the different, the private public uh, dial was slightly more towards private and we maybe have dialed it more towards public and so, uh, well, what's different about blogging than, than what I would describe as, I guess, writing for myself uh, is, is access to the development of the prose. And I think that moment that you're talking about where the prose has been prepared and then it is released, uh, that's like a very, that's a moment to savor, I think, as a writer and maybe one that like blogging doesn't always offer, but it offers something different. It offers a kind of, um, a kind of extended public moment for the writer. So. Uh, I think I think there's like there's value to both, but I think in the same way that people talk about film as a director's medium and television as a writer's medium, I wonder if like blogging is it an audience's medium. So I, I might just say also a personal footnote, and I like that you used a, a writing word <laughs> to describe an anecdote. Um, when I was keeping that American Idol blog, and so many people were looking at it, it was so fascinating to me and also when I posted my audition video on YouTube um, and it got 
to like tens of thousands of hits before they took it down for copyright violation without telling me. Um, it was so interesting, the tone of people's comments on the video and on the blog. They very much, I felt, were kind of channeling Simon Cowell as this like scowly voice, you know, like one of my favorite comments on the video was um, that piece of beef, B-E-A-F, and you know, there were other ones like number one, can't sing, number two, ugly, you know. I never, none of which I ever deleted. I felt like they were also part of the medium and, and that something really interesting was happening in terms of the way that um, reality TV, um, specifically Simon Cowell, but reality TV I would say more generally, was affecting people's voices. And I would say that, in a sense, to come back to your question, I would say that maybe blogs are like the new reality TV. Um, but I think that, I wanna stop shy of saying that <laughs> the internet is almost too democratic in terms of like anyone can write and anyone can say anything and maybe they aren't putting as much time or thought into it. That's kind of like a terrible, um, interpretation of the internet and democracy, but, um, but sometimes it feels that way. <laughs> well, I, I think there's an, an anti-democratic aspect to the internet too, and, um, and, and to all networks. Um, it, it's not absolute, but um, you, know, you can look at like the first network, Roman Roads, and that was used to build an empire so networks serve to monopolize and consolidate power. And even though anyone can post something online, there's, a, there's still a hierarchy. Uh, and um, and I, th I think we have to look at um, how information is received. And I think one, one model that's still helpful is um, Herbert Marcuse's notion of repressive tolerance that uh, it's more effective rather than to censor something just to let a lot of information out into the system and, uh, you know, and, you know, and that's predicated on the idea that there's a surplus of information that people can't absorb it all and um, you know, the, dis the dissident information will simply get lost among uh, other, other messages. I guess I'll ask this to all three of you, but sort of what are your thoughts on kind of being oversaturated with media and, you know, um, like what are your, sort of your personal feelings of being sort of inundated with, with lots of information constantly and like uh, what, how has that become sort of like a value today? Um, like is it sort of a character trait now that you can handle like 10,000 feeds in the morning and also like catch up on all the TV shows and, you know, like there's sort of this reverse reaction now that like, of like younger people going to farms and like finding silence. But like, to me, part of me feels like, is that like a sign of weakness? Like things aren't gonna slow down. So why retreat? Like, and, and I'm, I'm like curious as like, you know, just how to deal with that. I, I personally hear people complain about the idea of information overload all the time, but it doesn't bother me at all. I love it, and I can choose not to read the 10,000 feeds or watch Orange is the New Black <laughs> or whatever, um, although I frequently choose to just constantly consume media, but that's a choice. Um, but I'm interested in the, the presence of that conversation and the history of that conversation. Um, you know, a lot of it used to come in the form of like talking about the city and the impact of the city. And still now, I always love when um, there are these interesting studies that will come out about like, oh, New York City has X number of decibels compared to other cities, and it's having this tangible effect on people's health and psychology and things like that. Um, there's also the concept of decision fatigue that apparently. Um, all library studies students learn about that it's just so overwhelming to decide you know which shelf to be putting which book on all the time or what 
words to pluck from a taxonomy that you can get a headache. <laughs> um, but I don't, I don't know. I feel like information overload is like. I don't know. I feel like you would know the history of that term somehow, but it just feels like it's this like just problem that's described as a problem for the idea of complaining about something, but it doesn't bother me. I don't know. I I, I agree with almost all of what you said, and I think that uh, I think that it is a, it's a kind of new term for an old problem, um, and I think that. Uh, I almost read something from the essay about Ulrika Beck, who is a sociologist um, that passed away while I was in Rome, but um, I did a lot of thinking about him while I was there. I think he, for me, he unlocks a lot of these questions uh, through an argument he, he calls individualization, which is essentially that as information increases within a system, it becomes, it, people have more anxiety about how to individualize themselves because more is known. And so, uh, essentially, the, the retreating becomes a way to individualize, like the, the, the claiming of, of over-simulation becomes a way to identify oneself. Um, I do think that it's a choice, and I find myself less overwhelmed by knowing that. <laughs> so, I totally agree. Yeah, for me, it's not so much a matter of retreating, because I haven't gone out that much. Like, I, I, I don't use social media, <laughs> and um, just with my my work as a teacher, I, um, I'm always fielding um, a lot of emails. Uh, and, um, but when I do go out, it's more for researching something. And then, um, you know, I think of how I used to research things. And, it, you know, it used to be such a long process. Now, uh, research can happen in such an efficient manner. So, um, yeah, that's that's more or less my relationship to it, and it it's not it's not that I'm a luddite, but I just engage technology in in specific ways, and then in other ways not. Um. There's a question. I teach too, yeah. So you guys all have hung out with, can you hear me? Yeah. You all hung out with people who are um, very, you know, very young, very new to all these movies. This is the way the media is, is impacting their ability to read, to speak, to, to clarify or articulate their own thoughts or focus their own thoughts. So I guess the, the comment, the question I sort of wonder about a lot is the craft of writing, different kinds of crafts. See, I really just think it's age. Like, I, I'm sorry to say that. That might be really, like, really, like, too simplistic. But I really, like, I feel less concerned about it as I get older. 
and I can feel tangibly that calming down for me because I am not interested in everything anymore. Uh, you know, I'm interested in the things I'm interested in, and my identity is 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 firmer than it was when I was in school. And so, I, I think it's I don't want to say it's like a young person's problem, but I think it's any person's problem that is developing an identity, you know, and a, and a way of working. I mean, I would just, I think you, the, the answer is in your question, I would just be far less normative about it, you know? Like, I, I don't think that there's only one way to write, clearly, and like, there's not only one way to be a designer or an artist or anything either, so just don't be normative about it, especially if you're teaching a, in a creative context. I, I teach at Barnard College, uh, which is a women's college, and um, the uh, visual arts concentration is... Uh, within the art history department. Uh, so I find there that this, almost all the students are amazingly good writers. And um, so I, I don't see, you know, in that school, I don't see any correlation between writing skills or lack thereof and online media. They, um, sometimes I'll have a quiet student who, you know, I think isn't doing anything, then she turns in her paper and you know, I feel like I didn't know the gun was loaded or something. <laughs> but um, but uh, at School of Visual Arts, for example, uh, which has a, a kind of anti-intellectual climate, um, there I dread having to look at um, artist statements. Uh, there, it's just horrible. Um, <laughs> and... and um, and just the, you know, the basic uh, ability, even if like, the idea behind it is interesting, it, the form it comes out in is so muddled and uh, unformed, um, it's, it can be really frustrating. But, uh, yeah, so I think it, you know, based on my teaching in two places, uh, I see it more in terms of like, who the students are rather than um, what the state of technology is right now. Uh, and then to go to your other question, um, I'm happy I grew up when I did uh, because uh, a lot of what fed into my art making impulse was just playing in the woods and not dealing with any, which may sound kind of romantic or something, but it was just, um, you know, that's what my childhood was like. We had a woods in the back of our house. Um, I wasn't dealing with it electronic media, maybe watched a little bit of TV, but, um, you know, it was more interesting to be outside and to do stuff outside. I'll just add really quickly um, to that, to both of your questions. The question as to what we had before the internet, I think for me the, the example is just channel surfing on television. Um, I grew up doing quite a bit of that and the remote control, I would say, had a defining uh, role in my life. Um, but, uh, yeah, sorry, I just got lost thinking about whether Google is the new remote control. Uh, <laughs> we can talk about that later. Um, but anyway, um, I think that in terms of the teaching thing, to me, the what feels like the obvious answer is that the way to teach writing is by um, having the students do a lot of reading and close reading. Um, for me, that's, that's what it was. It was being um, sort of raised in an undergrad environment. I mentioned that I went to a rhetoric department, and so it was really about very, very close reading. Something I had to learn to become comfortable with as a professor was the concept of silence and not always having to fill the moment. Um, or the void with words, but actually just sit and read and look and think really closely about text. And then the other thing was um, learning to kind of um, use one type of text to close read another text, like a Freud essay to read a Hitchcock film or something like that, um, was, uh, yeah, something that really helped me. Um, think a lot about language and how to use language um, critically.
I think that's also a technique that can um, get to the ideology behind um, different sources to this kind of cross-reading thing. Yeah, so could we, we're going to move to our last and short phase of the evening here. Um, so Brian and Marissa. Uh, I just want to jump in as a, also as a Amanda, professor. If you want to join up on the stage. So I teach in a slightly different context, and I'm a little bit of fish out of water, but I think it's interesting to think, I mean, architects, I teach in a school of architecture at Northeastern University. And I teach largely history theory classes, and so my students do a lot of writing. But I'm struck by your comment that I love this. We're like at a happening now. Um, <laughs> um, I am struck by your distinction between the Barnard students and the art students because I still think that reveals a kind of differentiation between the student that is a classically well-trained liberal art student that the papers are good versus the artist or the art that, that doesn't know how to write. And um, I. It's something, and I think also really, at least at Northeastern, which again is a, is a, um, a school that is maybe doesn't have a strong liberal arts focus, I do find that writing is not integrated in any meaningful way into our educational system for our design students. And I think that's partly because they're marked as design students. And so you don't need to understand that in the same way that a rhetoric student does or that an English major does. And so, you know, one thing I'm also struck recently, though, is I think there's the, the sea change in a kind of pedagogy of also like a project-based learning sort of system where that to me also feels a little bit scary because I think that there's so much focus, at least in my teaching, on constantly we're giving workshops on how to students, it's all inquiry-based and there's no more, this whole idea that you don't instruct any longer and you don't, I'm not the sage on the stage and it's all student-driven, but that also scares me a little bit and maybe this is just my old age because it doesn't, in terms of teaching those skills, particularly of writing and making an argument and all that, I'm not sure where we find a place for that. So I don't have an answer to your question, but I, I feel the same crisis kind of, I guess is what I'm saying. But, but one thing I'd, I'd like to say, at least within the art world, I, I don't think that there is a um, presumption of artists being inarticulate anymore. I, I think Rather, there's a sense, even if there's not like a literal text involved, that um, that an artwork is uh, something that's part of a discourse. So there's a textual implication, and I, I think most artists are aware of that, even if they don't, you know, produce text per se. Uh, and then when it comes, I think this is one of the prompts. Uh, that was <laughs> given, but when it comes to like, well, how does how does writing function vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis an art career or something like that? I I have a, a friend who's an artist from Argentina, although he's been in New York for many years, uh, Nick Guanini, who who writes, but he's also has quite a cynical view, and he says like, well, writing's uh, like an insurance policy, like you can have. <laughs> A couple bad seasons, but if you're writing, you can still like keep yourself afloat. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's not so much my view, but I, I, I was struck by Nick's uh, kind of um, cynical pragmatism. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I've been teaching writing here at RISD for about ten years, and um, I have always kind of subtly, I hope. Um, encourage students to write because it would en um, engender a kind of agency for them out in the world. And Marissa, hearing your story about post-internet and the kind of, um, uh, you know, the kind of uh, strain that the term has created, and, and I hadn't thought about Capro and, and the term happenings in that same way, that, you know, it also has its dangers, you know. Um, it's. John, in the, in the introduction to your collected writings, Mike Kelly wrote about the kind of threat to the artist in being mute, in, in sort of taking that stance, that forced um, muteness, and how um, it was so important to kind of claim the discourse uh, in order to set the terms that were real and true, um, and not the ones that critics were um, imposing, right? But even when you do and when you kind of coin a term that has so much currency now, it, I mean, I think the response to that term has everything to do that, with the fact that it has traveled the universe in the way that it has, right? It maybe never would have 
20, 30, 40 years ago. And you could have said, <laughs> it would have been a simple story. <laughs> Where you post internet response mm. to the German president. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to just mention anecdotally that sometimes when I teach, probably at least one day every semester, if not more, I will start a class by just saying, okay, um, for the first 10 minutes of class, we're just going to write. Um, and it, it doesn't really matter what, what class it is. It's just, I'll just ask people to write, and I'll ask them to write with paper and, and a writing implement. And it makes them so angry, for one thing. They're like, ah. And then they, 10 minutes all of a sudden just feels like the longest time to them. And there's also this funny, a couple other funny things that will happen, which is that often it's like there's only one or maybe two students in the class who even have paper or a pen, and they're always like loaning it out to other students. Um, and then it's funny to like see them going like this after like the first minute because you know they're not like me they didn't grow up with the middle finger callus you know from holding the pencil um, they're just they're typists <laughs> so it's interesting to just think about writing itself in the classroom too but but I can kind of sympathize with your students like I find when I write like writing the first draft is really painful like a I don't like sit down and relish that at all. It's like, uh, it's, I find it really arduous. And then going back and kind of refining, like that's more fun, but getting like the initial set of ideas out, um, it's kind of torturous for me at least. Um. That's, that's, uh, that's uh, last time I was here, um, I talked a little bit about this, but like the kind of, not having that moment when you sit down to write and that kind of, but like trying to be writing continuously. So I feel like if you're sitting at a lecture, that, that, is that not writing? Like, or if you're like, if, if you're taking notes and responding and, and stuff, or if you're like, if you're just uh, walking around, like sometimes I will just take like an, an audio note. I will just like be like, I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about this and I'll just like free associate. Um, I feel like generating text is for me like, I found a lot of anxiety around that moment where you're like, I have to now start. Uh, and so if it's like sort of like dissolving the moment